Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, my name is Philip Chang, and I'd like to thank the Sarcoma Alliance for inviting me to speak to you uh, about the benefits of exercise and rehabilitation. Um, so before we get started, just a quick disclaimer that this presentation is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as customized medical advice specific exercise recommendations and precautions should be discussed with your healthcare provider as indicated. Um, I do not have any disclosures. The objectives for this session are going to include recognizing the benefits of therapeutic exercise, discussing precautions before engaging in an exercise program, to review exercise intensity targets, and to discuss benefits of rehabilitation in sarcoma. Um, so uh, by now, there's been tons of research that has been done in, um, with uh, exercise and cancer, and we know that there are numerous benefits available behind it, and one of those benefits is in cancer prevention, and we know that those who engage in exercise regularly uh, have decreased chance of um, forming uh, seven different kinds of cancer, including uh, the ones listed here. Uh, we also know that exercise uh, connotes a survival benefit. Um, with significant reductions in all cause mortalities in breast, colon, and prostate cancer. And of note, um, there's also uh, uh, reductions in um, specifically cancer uh, causes of mortality in, in these cancers as well. And uh, finally, we know and can see from this graphic here uh, from the American College of Sports Medicine that there are uh, numerous benefits in terms of various areas of quality of life. Um, and basically the way um, that they found this out is the American College of Sports Medicine kind of got together with all the other big wigs um, in the cancer and exercise world, including the NCI, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the CDC, American uh, Physical Therapy Association, the American uh, Academy of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation. Um, and they basically reviewed all of the different studies that have been done in the realm of exercise in um, those with cancer. And in reviewing all those different studies, they found that there was very strong evidence um, for kind of the things in the middle of the graphic here, which we'll zoom in on. Um, so we know that there's very strong evidence um, that those who follow exercise recommendations have alleviation of cancer-related fatigue, which we know um, is a problem that is basically universal in anybody who is undergoing treatment for cancer, particularly with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Um, they also saw that there were strong levels of evidence for improvements in health-related quality of life, as well as physical function, um, and also alleviation of mood-related symptoms uh, like anxiety and depression. Furthermore, uh, they found that there is a moderate level of evidence that uh, regular exercise improves bone health as well as improves sleep. Um, so their specific recommendations for exercise um, were uh, that people should be getting 150 minutes uh, per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity and two to three days per week of strength training uh, targeting major muscle groups. And when we compare this to the physical activity guidelines um, from the National Conference of Cancer Network that were just updated uh, this year, um, we see that they are very much in line with one another as the NCCN also um, states that we should be aiming for 150 minutes of moderate in in intensity exercise, but they also state that that could be substituted for 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity uh, throughout the week. And then they uh, again go on to state that resistance training should occur two to three times per week. And they also add in that uh, stretching of major muscle groups uh, should occur uh, twice a week. And in general, uh, sedentary uh, behavior should uh, be avoided for prolonged periods. Um, now we uh, recognize and they recognize that 150 minutes of modern intensity activity is, is quite a lot. Um, so they also have a uh, recommendation for initial prescription um, for those who are just kind of getting started out in an exercise program. And uh, they recommend kind of a reduced frequency of one to three days per week. And that intensity could be either light to moderate um, of either aerobic or resistance training, and that the initial time goal per uh, session should really depend on an individual's baseline level of fitness and exercise tolerance. Um, so, you know, some people might be able to tolerate 20 minutes in a single session, others 10, and, you know, others might be able to do five minutes or less, and that's all okay, but it's about starting wherever you're able to start at, and then kind of gradually progressing from there. 
Um, so informing these guidelines kind of with all these other uh, big groups in cancer and um, exercise and rehabilitation medicine, the American College of Sports Medicine was very careful that they didn't want to be creating any barriers to people starting on an exercise program. And by that, they meant that they didn't want um, people to necessarily have to be going through a bunch of medical assessments and clearance from physicians before engaging in an exercise program into that. And they did state um, in their guidelines that no assessments are required to start on a low intensity aerobic training or resistance training with gradual progression or flexibility program in most survivors. So again, the, the key word there is most as you know, that um, doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. And they go on to state that medical clearance may still be indicated depending on an individual's exercise and health history and depend or, and as far as what those specific indications are, um, they did defer to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network survivorship uh, guidelines, which we see here. Um, so in terms of risk assessment before starting on an exercise program, the NCCN kind of characterizes um, two different kinds of uh, populations. So if you are an individual that has a history of peripheral neuropathy, arthritis, musculoskeletal issues, poor bone health, or lymphedema, they do recommend a pre-exercise medical evaluation and that whatever exercise regimen is undergone, that um, it is modified based off of the recommendations from that assessment. And they also recommend consideration for referral to uh, trained uh, exercise personnel um, for an exercise program. Um, and then they kind of recognize um, this um, other group of kind of higher risk um, before uh, engaging in an exercise program. We see that in the bottom uh, left box here. So if you've had a history of lung surgery or major abdominal surgery, if you have an ostomy or a history of heart failure, coronary artery disease, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, ataxia, or severe fatigue even, which is a large number of individuals, severe nutritional deficiencies, uh, which is a large number of individuals, and a worsening or changing uh, physical condition, which is uh, certainly subjective, but um, may apply to a lot of individuals with a new diagnosis as well. They do recommend a pre-exercise medical evaluation with clearance by a physician prior to starting um, on a program, um, and again, a referral to trained personnel. Um, so a quick note about COVID-19. Uh, so the CDC um, does recognize that having a uh, cancer diagnosis does increase uh, your risk of severe illness from COVID-19, meaning increased risk for hospitalization, admission to an intensive care unit, increased risk for intubation, increased risk for mortality. And in light of those increased risks um, for engaging in the exercise program, uh, it is recommended that you uh, would use masks, that you uh, would incorporate social distancing. And if you are able to, and it's recommended by your physician uh, that you should undergo vaccination. Okay, so back to our exercise recommendations. What exactly constitutes moderate intensity or vigorous intensity aerobic activities? You can see, um, going back to our graphic at the very bottom, which uh, we've outlined in red here, they actually define what those things are. So if we zoom in, we can see that they define moderate intensity activity as working out at 40 to 59% of your heart rate reserve or VO2 reserve, um, whereas vigorous level of activity um, is working at the 60 to 89 percent of your heart rate reserve or VO2 reserve. So, you know, what does all that mean? <laughs> so we'll uh, kind of go back to um, what the original uh, target, target heart rate zones for aerobic activity uh, were previously. And basically, this was all uh, based off of age. Um, so basically, um, we can see that the previously kind of recommended target heart rate zones were between 50 to 85% of your maximum heart rate. And the maximum heart rate was uh, defined uh, using a very simple formula of 220 minus whatever your age is. Um, and then using that maximum, average maximum heart rate, as we can see on the right, um, they would calculate whatever your target heart rate zone would be uh, by taking 50 to 85% of that. And we can see some rather large um, target heart rate zones here just based primarily off age. So for example, if we have a 40 year old person um, we would calculate that their heart rate max is 220 minus 40, which would be 180. And then taking 50% of that for a lower bound of our heart rate um, would be 90. And 85% of that heart rate max um, would give us 153 for our upper bound of that target heart rate zone. And we would say that, you know, you want your heart rate to be between 90 and 153 when you're exercising to be getting that moderate benefit.
So the problem with this method is that it doesn't take into account an individual's level of fitness. And you know, um, for those who do not engage in regular physical activity, we are not going to have the same uh, heart um, baseline heart rates as somebody who you know runs marathons on a regular basis. So. Um, because of this, um, we have this idea of the heart rate reserve. So the heart rate reserve is basically defined as how much your heart is able to continue beating uh, beyond whatever the resting heart rate is. So we can see that that is uh, performed using this uh, formula here of whatever our maximum heart rate is minus our resting heart rate, uh, where the maximum heart rate, again, is 220 minus your age. Um, so going back to our 40-year-old individual here, we can pretend that maybe he has a resting heart rate of 70. And from there, uh, knowing that his heart rate max is 180, we can um, use uh, the formula of max minus resting heart rate, and we get a heart rate reserve for this individual of 110. And from there, we go back to our formula provided by the American College of Sports Medicine, uh, where a moderate in level of intensity is 40 to 59% of the heart rate reserve. And we can use this uh, Carbonin formula to calculate what the uh, lower and upper limits of the moderate intensity heart rate should be um, when we are exercising. We can see um, that when we plug in all the numbers, it comes out to 114 to 135 for an individual who is 40 years old with a resting heart rate of 70. And we can see that that is much uh, of a, that, that's a much more narrow window um, than the window given to us uh, purely by uh, the age calculation here. Um, so um, the same thing can be done for uh, vigorous intensity exercise. Um, again, it would just be for um, that higher uh, threshold of 60 um, uh, percent and higher. Um, so in, in terms of VO2, VO2 specifically is how much oxygen our body is utilizing uh, kind of uh, during exercise. And the actual way to measure VO2 is actually quite uh, complicated and laborious. You actually have to get like on a treadmill or a cycle and you have to exert yourself to your, your maximum extent. And then all the while you have this big mask on your face that you can see in the bottom uh, left picture here where they're actually um, measuring how much oxygen you're actually burning through. Um, uh, thankfully, um, with the advent of all these fancy fitness devices and activity monitors we have, um, uh, like the Garmin, I think the Apple uh, Watch Series 6, um, and certain kinds of Fitbits, we're actually able to um, kind of estimate uh, what our, our VO2 is. Um, and uh, if you are so inclined, you could also um, kind of uh, titrate your uh, exercise regimens to your VO2 if you have one of these uh, fitness trackers. Um, and basically you calculate the VO2 reserve in the exact same way that you calculate the heart rate reserve, which is your VO2 max, um, which can be uh, measured on a fitness activity tracker. And then um, you subtract from that your VO2 at rest, um, which for most people is going to be around 3.5 milliliters per minute uh, per kilogram. Um, so again, you can calculate um, with using kind of the same formulas, um, if you're so inclined to, uh, we're not going to go through that here, but if you're interested, this is how you could do it. Um, so uh, not everyone is necessarily super interested in knowing exactly what their heart rate would, should be or exactly what their VO2 should be while they're um, exercising. So there is another method of knowing if you're meeting that moderate intensity threshold or if you're meeting that vigorous intensity threshold. And that's by uh, trying to um, gauge what your uh, level of exertion is. So this is actually the Borg scale of perceived exertion. Um, and what we want to be going for, uh, for a moderate level of exercise is this level of somewhat hard. And basically what these numbers or these Borg ratings uh, correlate to is if you multiply that by 10, that's a rough estimate of what your heart rate is at that time. Um, so kind of expanding on this idea um, is basically gauging what your level of uh, activity is, whether light, moderate, or vigorous, uh, based off of your current work of breathing. So this is um, from the National Conference of Cancer Network's uh, Survivorship Physical Activity Guidelines. And um, basically, if you're doing light exercise, there shouldn't be any noticeable change in breathing. And we can see uh, these different example activities here. Um, if you're doing moderate level of exercise, your work of breathing should be as such that you're able to talk, but you're not, you're working out so hard that you can't sing. And if you are vigorously exercising, um, you should be able to say a few words without stopping to catch a breath, but really you shouldn't be able to do more than that. And we can see, I just highlighted here that yoga is um, under every category of exercise type, which I think just goes to show um, it, you can be doing a lot of these different kinds of activities um, at different levels um, of intensity, 
but it, um, it, it really should just be titrated to um, how hard really your, your breathing is. Um, so with that said, um, the, the goal really is to be active um, and to have kind of an active lifestyle. So, you know, take the stairs, avoid the escalator or the elevator, park in the back of the parking lot and do kind of whatever is needed um, to, you know, boost um, your steps throughout the day. Um, so you can really kind of be reaching um, those recommended activity guidelines and, and hopefully getting uh, the, those benefits that were previously described. Uh, so finally, um, I'd like to discuss the uh, benefits of rehabilitation. Um, so we know uh, that and are aware that for people undergoing treatment, um, a lot of times those treatments may include uh, surgery um, and uh, radiation therapy, and those can uh, result in different functional deficits. So for example, if you are uh, undergoing a surgery that may require amputation, um, that would certainly uh, result in functional deficit. And we uh, can see the different levels um, of amputation of the upper limb and lower limb here. Um, we know uh, that for those who undergo radiation therapy, that radiation fibrosis can occur. Um, and radiation fibrosis is, excuse me, the uh, progressive uh, tissue hardening and dysfunction that can occur in response to radiation therapy. Um, and uh, basically the manifestation of those symptoms from that tissue hardening um, is what we call radiation fibrosis syndrome. Um, and that encompasses things like tightness, loss of range of motion, swelling, muscle loss, and numbness, depending on, on the structures that are affected. Um, and uh, we can kind of see that illustrated in this picture here. So on the left, we kind of see um, normal looking tissue, but on the right, we can see this deposition of this fibrin tissue or this fibrous tissue, um, which is really analogous to kind of scar tissue and it kind of chokes off the blood vessels and the nerves and, and the muscles, which can result in a lot of the symptoms of tightness and uh, pain and um, a loss of range of motion that we oftentimes see. So radiation, by, uh, the effects of radiation are often uh, split up into either being acute, early delayed or late delayed where acute effects occur during or immediately after treatment, early delayed effects occur up to three months after finishing treatment, and late delayed effects occur uh, more than three months after uh, the completion of treatment. Um, and uh, we oftentimes see uh, people coming in with these late delayed effects where, you know, they have, may have finished radiation therapy months or even years ago, but just now uh, they're starting to develop some tightness, discomfort, or um, loss of range of motion. Um, so, uh, before we kind of discuss the um, kind of supportive rehabilitation treatments that are available for those things, I just uh, quickly want to state um, that while there's not a lot of high level therapy at uh, high levels of evidence supporting therapy specifically uh, for radiation fibrosis, there are a couple therapies um, that have a limited evidence base um, uh, of working, and those are hyperbaric oxygen therapy and pentoxifibin with or without vitamin E. Um, and in um, some smaller studies, um, these two treatments have been shown in some cases to um, uh, slow down the progression of radiation fibrosis or even reverse it to an extent. So um, something to, to keep in mind. Um, and then another thing, of course, that can occur is ner nerve injury, whether from radiation or from uh, surgery. Uh, so here we can see the different nerves uh, that provide sensation to the upper limb and here different nerves that provide sensation to the lower limb. And um, if any of these nerves become damaged, you can have altered sensation or perhaps pain in the distribution of these nerves or um, resulting weakness um, if that uh, nerve is also um, providing function to some muscles. Um, so we can see really that there's a number of different sequelae that can result from either amputation, radiation fibrosis, or nerve injury, um, including things like pain, weakness, loss of range of motion, difficulty with walking, difficulty with transfers. So that's things like getting out of bed, getting out of a chair, going to the bathroom, um, or difficulty with performing everyday activities like showering or getting dressed. Um, so there are a lot of different things that uh, rehabilitation can do to kind of help with each one of these different uh, problems. Um, and just starting off with pain, there's um, a lot of different things that can be done with pain. Uh, kind of all the uh, uh, medications highlighted here on the left are medications that um, have better evidence of working for nerve, um, nerve related pain specifically. Um, and then there's, of course, a bunch of different interventions and injections that can be done as well as, as well as uh, various different modalities that can be done for um, the purposes of treating pain. So if pain is something you're dealing with. Um, please just keep in mind that there's almost always something that can be tried. And um, I would urge you to um, work with your medical teams to um, 
um, explore um, uh, uh, all, all the different kinds of modalities that are available. Um, if amputation is something that you've undergone, of course, there are a number of different prosthetics available, um, and you can work with your rehabilitation physicians, your surgeons, your, uh, your prosthetists um, in exploring which ones would be best for you. Um, if um, amputation, um, uh, an amputation is something that is being considered for your treatment, um, there is oftentimes preoperative uh, counseling available. So, you know, even before undergoing surgery, you can talk to either a rehabilitation physician or your surgeon or even a prosthetist in some cases um, to discuss, you know, what the amputation will um, entail and what the um, course of rehabilitation um, as well as uh, prosthetic fitting will look like um, afterwards. So um, that's something I'd also uh, encourage you to um, speak with your medical teams about. Um, for those who kind of just need um, some extra support, um, there are a number of different braces available kind of for most levels of the body. Um, and uh, here we see some ankle foot orthotics as uh, well as some um, wrist uh, and hand orthotics. And these are basically just braces that can either um, help to maintain range of motion or help to support a, a weak limb. But there are a number of these different things um, available um, and uh, rehabilitation providers or um, uh, a certified orthotist could um, help you uh, in figuring out kind of which one would be the best for you. Um, and then finally are the, all the different skilled therapies that are available um, for uh, anybody who has a functional deficit. So physical therapy, of course, focuses more on lower body strengthening and things like relearning to walk. Um, and they also um, use a variety of different modalities uh, listed here. Then there's occupational therapy, which focuses more on upper body strengthening, as well as relearning of everyday activities like showering, dressing, eating, driving, and uh, preparing meals. Um, for those specifically with hand deficits, there are specially trained um, occupational therapists who only focus on the hand and they're certified um, in hand therapy, and they can um, help uh, with the restoration of uh, hand strength as well as um, uh, fine motor um, function of the hand with uh, things, involve things like you know, writing or, or typing. Um, and uh, finally, if um, lymphedema is, is something that you're dealing with as a, a result of treatment, um, then uh, lymphedema, specialized lymphedema therapists who uh, do uh, something called complete decongestive therapy, and uh, which can be very helpful in decreasing the amount of swelling uh, that there is um, and really helping uh, people to become proficient in doing their own decongestion uh, to reduce uh, the swelling in, in the valve limb. Uh, can be very helpful. And uh, I just listed this website here, clt-mana.org. Um, and that's the um, kind of the official website to find a certified lymphedema therapist um, in your area, if, that, if that's something that you're needed. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions right now. And um, uh, I've just kind of listed here some of the summary findings um, uh, that we discussed um, regarding uh, exercise. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Learned so much. Um, we have some questions. Um, so, uh, Dr. Chang, should we push ourselves to do the recommended exercise when our body is already exhausted from lack of sleep and work? I used to do this and feel that I have stressed my body, which may have lowered my immune system and caused the illness, cancer. Can this be true? So uh, that's a really great question. Um, I'm not personally aware of any studies that have shown that, you know, over exercising um, would um, weaken the immune system. I, I'm not aware of that. There are certainly like specific, very specific situations in which exercise is contraindicated, um, but those are more situations like uh, neurologic disorders, like Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, um, in which you have very weakened muscles and, you know, over you know, being overly active could damage your muscle tissue. Um, but in general, for a case like this, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware that it could weaken your immune system. But again, I would say that it's, yeah, you, you certainly don't want to push yourself to exhaustion. And it is about, you know, doing what you're able to tolerate. So um, oftentimes for my patients who are kind of on active chemotherapy, um, a lot of times they feel down um, uh, for, you know, uh, for like seven to 10 days after each infusion. And, you know, what I tell them is that, you know, you're going to feel 
um, yeah, you're going you're gonna to feel pretty weak during those times. And you don't necessarily have to push yourself because of course you need rest too. Um, but I think it's doing as much as you're able to. And again, keeping in mind um, those intensity limits. So if you are feeling weaker, then you, know, you may not take as much to reach that moderate level of activity that we were discussing. Um, so I, I think that's something to keep in mind. And I think the importance of sleep is very important to, you know, that's the sleep is so important. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and exercise does help you with sleep. You think yeah. So yeah, sleep, again, yeah, you know? there's, yeah. So there's, yeah, that kind of that uh, beneficial cycle um, where, you know, if you exercise more, uh, again, um, the American College of Sports Medicine did find moderate levels of, um, or moderate um, evidence uh, that uh, exercise can actually help with sleep. Um, and then is there a real, is real rehabilitation of any use for chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy? Yes, that is another fantastic question. So yes, rehabilitation is a fantastic use for chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. Um, so there's a couple, there's a couple things about this. Um, so the primary use of rehabilitation for uh, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy that I use is um, that it helps with balance and gait difficulty. So if you're having, you know, if you're tripping frequently, or if you have significant weakness um, from your neuropathy, or um, if you've had falls, then um, yeah, rehabilitation would be perfect for you. And uh, we've seen time and time again that those who undergo rehabilitation specifically focus on balance exercises can improve their balance. Um, now, whether or not how much it can help with actual pain symptoms or, or symptoms of discomfort is kind of more of the debate. Although there is a, a small amount of kind of preliminary evidence showing that um, therapeutic exercise can be helpful um, with symptoms also. Okay, and um, uh, one, uh, can you please show the email again? Oh, so, yes, of course. Um, let me just share my screen and then again here. While, while you're doing that, um, uh, the question is, are you able to give any information on vaccine recommendations for cancer patients who have undergone thoracotomy and has been hospitalized for pneumothorax? So, I mean, as far as I know, um, the CDC is recommending that, you know, high risk individuals, including patients with cancer, do be fully vaccinated. Um, and that immunocompromised individuals, which would be patients who have been on active treatment, something like chemotherapy, are recommended for a third dose, which I believe, um, again, I'm not an infectious diseases expert or an internist, um, but which I believe is not equivalent to a booster dose, but a third dose is just to reach the same level of immunity as a non-immunocompromised individual who had received two doses. Um, but as far as I know, yeah, all... Uh, um, anyone who has a diagnosis of cancer is recommended, um, but I would encourage you to speak uh, with your surgeon or your oncologist um, about that specifically. Yeah, so currently, you know, we're recommending, but again, you need to talk to your doctor, um, take advice from your doctor and no one else, mm -hmm. okay? We'll take it from the internet, take it from the doctor, from your doctor, but um, currently we are, you know, of course, recommending everyone to get be vaccinated regardless of whether they're on treatment or not. Um, and, um, and then the third dose, um, we are currently recommending it for anybody that's really worried about COVID or that they're currently undergoing treatment. Um, so, um, and, the, and you can, and they recommend that if you've had Pfizer vaccine, then you get the Pfizer third dose. And if you've had the Moderna, get the uh, Moderna uh, third dose. Um, so, um, and if you've been vaccinated um, after nine months to get the third dose. So for example, I was vaccinated in December and January, so I'll be getting my third dose uh, relatively soon. I have to calculate the math, but I think it's coming up. <laughs> I don't know where the time goes, but yeah. So, um, so that's, that's the latest um, guidelines. And, um, but you know, whether you're not on treatment, but you know, if you've had a thoracotomy, um, you know, technically, you know, you don't have as much lung reserve as someone that's never had part of their lung removed. So I would put I would put that at a higher risk category. Perfect.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chang, for joining us. Um, very, very informative. I appreciate it.